Ladies and gentlemen, it's one o'clock and I would like to call the Legislative Committee to order as well as other board members that are in attendance today. Uh, at this time, we will hear from Josh Waller, who is our Director of Policy and Government Affairs. Josh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, members of the committee, full board, commissioner, thank you for the opportunity to present today and give you an update. There we go, where we see those enhancements. <clears throat> so again, general overview of the IIJA, and then a big focus on the impact of the IIJA and the need for matching funds, and then wrap up with a state and legislative update. So first, this was just the recap of the process. So the president obviously announced earlier in the year an initiative to have the American Jobs Plan that had an infrastructure component, and, uh, and then Congress was concurrently working on reauthorizi reauthorizing the federal transportation bill. So you can see the House first passed the bill as the INVEST Act, came over to the Senate. The Senate was working on its authorization. And so the authorization that exists in the transportation bill and the, the IIJA was basically the core bill that was passed out of the Senate committees. And they were passed by a uh, bipartisan basis, no, no objections out of the two committees that passed out their versions. So that cobbled together with the other um, non-transportation infrastructure became the IIJA. So that's just important to keep in mind as we, as we talk and others, um, and others begin to wonder, okay, what are the opportunities? What, are the, what can be funded with the bill? So again, understand the allocation. About five, uh, 567 billion was going to USDOT, and then 633 for non-transportation. Some highlights of the non-transportation was power, broadband, water, and resiliency projects. On the USDOT side, the formula fund, so there's kind of two buckets to think about with the transportation funds. Those are the formula funds that come to each and every state um, on a formula, guaranteed funding, and that's based off of what the states have paid in. It's a, it's a combination of things, a decades old formula that's based off of population, based off what the state pays into the highway trust fund historically. And that's the, that formula has held pretty much similar since they've tweaked it back in the 2000s. This is what a one trust fee Correct, that's, so that's based off of that formula. So that's the guaranteed yeah. funding. And then you have the grant funds. So there's competitive grant funds that that are also a part of the bill. And that's one of the major components of increased funding. New funding is to the competitive program. So we'll have to obviously be mindful as the administration, USDOT, which is gonna be a big undertaking, goes and promulgates what do those rules look like? What are the criteria? And so you'll obviously state DOTs, local governments will be able to apply for those funds. And then the non-FHWA funds, so that's gonna be for transit, rail, airports, those other components, which we'll, we'll touch on each of those components as we move through this. Excuse me, what were resiliency funds? So that's, so resiliency projects that, and the, on the non-transportation side, that's just gonna be investments in non-transportation infrastructure towards uh, mitigating against, if you've had inclement weather, I think one of the things that it, that's, it's geared towards combating um, the effects of, of climate change. Mm -hmm. And so it's those type of investments in, in non-transportation infrastructure. To, but I'm just trying to highlight the non-transportation versus what part of this bill is, is transportation so that when you're talking with constituents, legislators, and other people that they get the understanding that it's not 1.2 trillion in transportation funds. That's the, what we're trying to underscore here. So when we look at the Federal Highway Administration funds, those guaranteed funds from the Highway Trust Fund that come to the state, we see about a 21% increase from the FAST Act. So from FY21 to FY22, it's about 300 million, 300, yeah, 300 million. Got to remind myself between M's, B's, and T's in this, right? So I don't get them mixed up. So that's an increase about 300 million. So this, what you're seeing here, the numbers you're seeing here are apportionment. Reminder about apportionment, that's the maximum limit. That's not what we're guaranteed, but it's the maximum amount. And so we'll get something, we'll get a, a second number, which will be the obligation limitation, which is the actual amount of funding we receive. So you can see the number 1.4 billion for FY21. Our obligation limitation for that year was 1.2. So it just gives you a sense that those numbers are the top line numbers and it will be something less, but the proportion of increase is in that ballpark. And then after the one year increase, it's a 2% inflation adjustment for the remainder of the five-year bill. 
So the key component to remember here is that these increased funds are, are going to require matching. State funds have to, we'll have to use at least 20% state funds to match. And so whether it's um, on the highway side, motor fuel, <clears throat> excuse me, highway side or, and motor fuel, we'll have to look at, and we pre presented this to the board before, is you know, impacts on HB 170 funding and other places where we've tried to dedicate state only funds. How do we figure out how to achieve that match or working with the General Assembly, identify other solutions to ensure we've got the match, not just for the formula programs, but to ensure the department can successfully compete for those, uh, that significant pot of competitive grant money. So I mentioned the 300 million. So this breaks out, this shows you it's not 300 million and it's spent on any project It goes into buckets highlight the top three, which is the National Highway Performance. So that program sees a one point, uh, 137 million increase <clears throat> from 21 to 22. Those projects are projects that are on the National Highway system only. So that's, it, that's very defined criteria. The next bucket of surface transportation block grant is a lot more, um, there's a lot more flexibility to including to off system investments. And there's a portion of this bill that goes to off system bridges. So there's a $55 million increase. A reminder of this program is that 55% of the funds in this program have to be uh, sub-allocated by population. So then that's also in an urbanized area would go to the MPOs. The highway safety improvement sees about a, a $20 million, $19 million uh, increase. And then you can see about a 2% increase uh, moving forward. Uh, skipping down, you see those in green. Those four green are the new programs. So carbon reduction is the first one, a $41 million investment with 2% adjusted. And when I presented this to the Freight and Logistics Commission, they, uh, they asked a good question that I tried to, my best to answer, and the commissioner jumped in to, to help, is like, what would be a project type in that? So I went ahead, hedged my bets this time, and I will read you the eligible projects under that program. So eligible projects under carbon reduction are establishing or operating a traffic monitoring, management, and control facility, public transportation projects, bicycle and PED, and, and ped facilities, advanced transportation and congestion management technologies, uh, ITS capital, efficient street lighting and traffic control devices, congestion pricing, mode shift, transportation demand management, and projects to reduce environmental and community impact of freight movement, alternative fuel vehicle deployment, diesel retrofits, certain CMAC eligible projects and port congestion reduction. So, got that covered. Uh, Excuse me, I heard you mention the word congestion pricing. Can you unpack that a little bit more or do you have any? I think, we'll, I think we'll have to wait for the guidance to come out from FHWA. That's, those were the criteria put in the bill. So, so FHWA will use that guidance from Congress to promulgate specific guidance to states before before the um, before we can start uh, seeking authorizations, I don't know what the commissioner has. Okay. So the Protect Formula program that is investment in infrastructure that's been impacted, similar to those non-transportation resiliency projects. These are transportation projects or assets that have been impacted by inclement weather, recurring flooding, and those type things. So those investments either in the roadway or in the right of way, walls, things of that nature to help help protect those against uh, future events. Then there's uh, two buckets of money that come from general funds. The first one is the Poor Fair Bridge Rehab and Re uh, Replacement Program. And I pointed this out to the commission, I'll point out to you, this is an example of what we call how they funded this was called worst to first. So most of the other things, like I said, is based off this population, you know, what the state pays in, in federal motor fuel taxes. But this one, they looked out across the nation and figured out, okay, who's got the most worst, who's got the worst bridges? they get the m more money. So because of Georgia's position relative to the whole country, we got the bare minimum, which stinks on the one hand, but is a testament to the fact this state um, pays, has, has, has made a major investment in replacing bridges. But that's one of those examples here where certainly we would have, we still got more bridges that we could take care of if, if we'd got more, more funds. Then the last one is, is the electric vehicle charging infrastructure. And that's basically um, funds to help install electric vehicle infrastructure. So that's one of those areas where we're definitely looking to the guidance to be promulgated to understand how that program is going to function. So next here is the, and you all have seen these slides for the most part before, because the bill, once it passed the Senate, went to the House, has not changed at all. It was just um, waiting for the House to get to a point where they could pass it. 
But here's a reminder of the increase in federal transit, 27.7%. And we don't have the specific breakout in those categories below, but looking at our previous um, allocation within the state, you can see the percentage, about half going to urbanized areas, 12% going to non-urbanized areas, the state of good repair grants at 26%. And as a reminder, those dollars that go within the, the footprint of the ATL authority will, be, will flow through the ATL to MARTA and to the other providers outside those funds flow through GDOT to the sub-recipient um, counties and, and city and operators of transit. Aviation, just a reminder on that one, we're still waiting on specific guidance, but our folks estimate about a five, I'll just point you to the bottom, the bottom bullet, five to 25% increase um, over existing funds. So the match uh, requirements on the highway side stay the same at about 80-20. Some of the program, so generally, there are some specific programs and there are some opportunities where you're, there's actually no match, but it's not, it's, it's specific programs and specific things you've got to do to qualify. There are some of those, but generally speaking, the preponderance of our, our, our funding is about 80-20. Transit side, it can be, the transit side's not necessarily 80-20, some of it's 50-50. It, and it just depends on the, the bucket of money uh, on the transit side. Josh, the formula for transit um, through ATL specifically, is what, what is the metric? Population size or the, the level of infrastructure already implemented or how does that work? I would, I'm, yeah, it's, a, it's a combination of several things, population and also transit service by its um, something mile, I forget what the transit, they break it down like transit mile served. And so it's a it is a formulaic approach to population and service what service area that's provided. All right. So next, I won't go through each of these, but this is the competitive grant program, and so you can get a sense of it. So twelve point five billion over five years for competitive bridges, and so being able to and that's that's sort of geared to, towards these larger bridges um, across various states, but that's certainly a large pot of money to compete for. The, the what was formerly called the infra program, eight billion over five years. The smaller that had been called Tiger before, now it's raised, and that's seven point five billion over five years. There's a new program dealing with freight, five billion over five years. Na National infrastructure project assistance really geared towards freight. There's a new rural surface transportation grant program geared towards rural communities, two billion over five. Some additional grant funds for electrical electric vehicle infrastructure. And then protect grants, very similar to that same program. There's some competitive grant programs that go along with those same programs that we have guaranteed funding for. Here's a look at some of the more multimodal or multi, it's, you got the inner city passenger rail, 12 billion over five years, 5 billion for Chrissy. And Chrissy, you've seen presentations from the intermodal committee before about the success departments had seeking Chrissy funds. This is another area that we'd certainly highlight that, that having state match, in this case, it has to be state general funds or state general general bond funds, uh, to have those funds available to be able to compete. I know we mentioned to the other day that we had one call for projects. The feds put the call for projects, but it was in between sessions. So we didn't have the matching funds available, nor the ability to, to guarantee the General Assembly was going to give us matching funds. So we had to decline submitting any projects because we couldn't, we couldn't attest to having the match. So that's one of the things we highlighted. The commission was being very thoughtful as we move forward to ensure if, if a significant portion of this federal bill is invested in competitive grants, ensuring this department has the ability to tap into those type funds to, to compete and bring as many dollars back to Georgia projects as possible. Then there's $3 billion for the Rail Crossing Elimination Grant Program, which has been, a, you know, it's certainly been a focus of the Freight and Logistics Commission, looking at some of these railroad crossings and then 400 million for reducing truck emissions at port facilities. So next I wanna highlight just a couple of pilot programs. Obviously we talked about vehicle electrification and the future of EVs. So Congress is focused on that impact that has on the Federal Highway Trust Fund and other states that relied upon gasoline taxes as those gasoline taxes become a smaller as that percent reduces over however ultimately EVs become deployed. Um, so they, they stood up this pilot program looking at the vehicle miles traveled um, uh, user fee model. And they stood up a, an advisory board that's gonna help the secretary identify ways to implement that program, but sort of look at, okay, how do we, how would we implement a national VMT and how will states 
potentially implement VMTs in their, in their state. The other pilot is reconnecting communities pilot program and that's geared towards, and it's 1 billion over five years, and that's geared towards communities that have been impacted particularly in an urbanized area by an interstate and reconnecting some of those communities. So that's, um, that, that made it into the bill. So this is for communities that have been particularly in an urbanized area where you had, so like the downtown connector, you look out the window. So that, and in other parts of the country where you had like in New Orleans and other places where the interstate in particular came in and divide communities. So it's looking at what are strategies that could exist to reconnect them. So a little bit more add on to that is, is there's two nuanced pieces to that. Um, there's one grants for the planning aspect of what needs to be done to understand or what the solution may be. And the second piece is grants for the capital construction to either to mitigate, remove, or provide some kind of new connection. And it's also pretty broad too. It might it might include things as such as not physical infrastructure, but you know, funding connectivity of, of, of transit or something that again promotes access and accessibility where there's this sort of physical divide. That, that it's a discretionary program, so you have to compete for them. I have a question, Madam Chair. On the uh, vehicle per mile, per mile user fee, the pilot program, is there enough information that's available so far to know if that pilot program where it may occur or if it will occur in a in a geographic location or if it's or if there's some other method they plan to use to to test this so i go back and i can pull the the full language but one of the components is they set that advisory board and they were the advisory board is going to be involved in kind of setting the parameters of the program identifying uh locations but they're they've got the 50 million over five years to um, I, so I think they're they're going to try and I, so where they deploy that I think is to be determined. I don't know if the commissioner has anything. Yeah, th this continues to build upon uh, something that was in the Fast Act. I have to look at my notes. It's called the Strategic Innovation for Revenue Collection Program, which exists. But this continues to fund that pursuit, and it actually adds the federal system to it, as in Josh's note, which is has been absent. Uh, as it relates to mileage based user fees and we'll come back to you probably uh, later next year. Uh, we have submitted for some competitive funding along with the, the Eastern Transportation Coalition, formerly known as the I-95 Coalition, who has actually been piloting some mileage based user fee cases up in the New England area and now their last pilot, which was three, got down to include North Carolina's participating. So we're we're going to try to join on with that work so we can understand how something like this might work and understand it. So and there's a couple of other pilots around the nation. That there's a road usage group uh, out in the the West Coast, and Oregon led the way with this some probably five years ago now. Uh, their pilot still, I think, is a couple thousand people. Uh, but so there's a lot of work going on, but this sort of aggregates that and also pushes it to sort of a fed, to a federal level, which hasn't really been done before. But we'll we'll keep you posted because this is obviously uh, with with a policy and in, in the uh, the trajectory of electric vehicles, it's something we all need to be thinking about of what how do we fund transportation in the future because uh, declining motor fuel uh, revenue certainly would have an adverse impact to do the very things that are in part of the IJA. So in conclusion on, on the federal piece, we just know that these increases in the formula, the guaranteed funds are certainly gonna require some, some decisions around how we ensure to match. And so that's something we, as, as for the board, the department work in the General Assembly is what strategy to use and the governor obviously, and OPB is how do we ensure that we've got the match necessary. And then on, <clears throat> similarly on the competitive grant program, and that's gonna be one that we have to make a decision or a decision has to be made. How do we ensure that we're in the best position possible to have the funds available to, to compete for those grants and ensure we've got the match, particularly on the side of when you look at some of the rail projects, because we don't have any guaranteed rail funds, um, but ensuring that we've got state general funds available for where we might pursue like Christie grants and other, other intermodal grants that aren't motor fuel or transportation fee eligible. But there's a catch. So here's the catch is that Congress has 
uh, right now we've got the appropriations process. So one thing is you, you've got the authorization bill, which is says the USDOT, you're allowed to go do the things you do. Here's what states are, are the maximum amount. Here's this guaranteed funding contract authority, which is a flavor of money different than others that they can, USDOT can make a promise to Georgia, Federal Highway makes a promise to Georgia DOT that when you've authorized it, we'll pay you back 80 cents on the dollar. But the cash in the bank still has to come through the appropriations process. So that once they pass it, it's sort of automatic. But right now, December 3rd is the current fiscal year 22 federal appropriations expire. There is one scenario. There's a scenario where if they were to decide instead of, um, if they just take that bill and extend it for the full year, it would basically neutralize any additional funds associated with the IIJA because it would be held at fast act levels. So the, there's two parts. So and usually this is not an issue with authorization is a guarantee of funds. F it gives the FHWA an ability that other agencies don't have, which is to commit to US to, to state DOTs to reimburse them. But the actual cash to do that reimbursement still requires annual appropriations to be passed. So it's like it's the, the authorization allows them to make promises other agencies can't, but you still need an appropriations act. The, the current appropriation continuing resolution is pegged to the FAST Act levels, not the new IIJA. So, if, so there could be a scenario where if they just do a clean, extend that CR for a full year, it will be at the FAST Act levels. They could do a hybrid where they, they have language that reflects the IIJA, or they could do omnibus appropriations, but it's not completely soup yet until December 3rd. And then you also have debt ceiling. So there's, there is a, this, this uh, I needed a, to make an adjustment as of this morning, Secretary Yellen said, the US Treasury Secretary Yellen said that she believes US Treasury can keep the debt limit going longer than December 3rd. So the debt limit may not concur, may not concur with the third. Um, they think they can get it to the 15th. So, so that's just, there's the catch. Hopefully, the, <laughs> So as, as a former house staff, uh, staffer, I can tell you calendars change. And uh, I have uh, I have been waiting on an appropriation 10, 11 years ago, waiting on an appropriation to pass so I could get in my car and drive home Christmas Eve back to Georgia. So they'll they'll probably depend on this plays out that but that's the current proposed calendar josh if i may uh going back to your days when you were a congressional staffer and to pick up on uh stacy's uh thought and questioning there if if in this catch we're in uh, congress elects for some reason not to fund this act that you just described how might that be reconciled because it seems to me if if they don't fund it, it's setting up a some type of authorization conflict that they've got to reconcile somehow. And I'm just curious if that if if I'm correct in, in thinking that way, and if so, how might it get resolved? So if Congress, let's say they just do a clean extension, makes no provision for the fact the IIJ passed, and so you're at fast act levels. I think US DOT would be in the position of giving guidance to all of their divisions that they are not to authorize money. There'll be guidance that'll come out and they'll say that they cannot authorize, they will not authorize funds in these particular programs or they will not authorize funds. The apportionment level or the obligation level will be set at what the FAST Act level would have been. And so that'll be, they'll have to, the onus will be on them to conform with the law to provide that guidance. So that's, that's the way it'll be reconciled is they just won't authorize more than they're able to do based off of what the Appropriations Act provided. That, so the additional monies above and beyond the FAST Act levels wouldn't be an operative until they pass the, a, a, an Appropriations Act that recognized those dollars. Hopefully this is a, well, 
but they still had the underlying authorization. Without an authorization, the FHWA they would have to shut the doors and there'd be no authorization period. So it's just the additive effect would be suspended. And that's a little bit of playing it forward. But that's generally how it would, I would think that that would play out. Madam Chair. Yeah. So add one more complexity is um, <laughs> to, to this, Josh, you really need to change that title. There's a catch. <laughs> but uh, part of the catch too is in the on the scenarios that may play out, there is uh, obviously, if you, you guys recall, the, a large portion of transportation funding comes from the Highway Trust Fund uh, at the federal level. And there, there was a scare at one point that Federal Highway would have to implement uh, cash management practices, which means delay reimbursements. And I think Josh mentioned that, but again, we, we pay the federal, we pay for all the work, seek a reimbursement from the feds. Uh, that had got pushed out. Their last uh, accounting that came from OMB had got pushed out, I think into the spring, early spring next year. At one point, it looked like before the end of this calendar year, that cash management had to go into place. So there, there's a lot of moving parts and, and I, we will just have to see how it plays out. But Josh is right, and I, I had written this down before. Transportation reauthorization always does a couple things. It sets policies and programs in place, and then an annual top line uh, budget number. But that is just that. It's just in the, it's in the law. That's the top line number. Appropriations every year fill the buckets up to that amount and historically never to that amount. It's always less uh, for various reasons. So, but it's complicated and we'll obviously we'll be watching between now and we'll have a board meeting on the night. I believe that's right. Is it the night? Yeah. So, uh, so we'll, we will keep you abreast of how that goes. And it probably will be in the media between now and then as well. Just, just guessing. So, uh, and, and the other thing, and Madam Chair, while I've got got the floor, I, I want to say this is a very boiled down version of the main components of IIJA, which is 2,602 pages. The condensed version that we got from ASHTO is only 200 pages. If you want an easier read, we'll be glad to share that. But there's there's a lot of other things that have to happen. Um, as Josh talked about, there there's what we call the plus ups of the existing program. So the existing things in FAST Act that remain with those increased funding levels, really easy to implement, notwithstanding the money part we just talked about. The new programs require rulemaking. So USDOT, Federal Highway, have to develop the rules, uh, engage the public through the, through the national public rulemaking process, receive comments, respond back, put the regs out, for us to then operationalize and ultimately seek what we call an authorization or the approval from the feds to do the work. So that's gonna take a little time. Same applies for the new discretionary programs that Josh highlighted, uh, which take another step. They have to go through that whole regulatory rulemaking process. Then they have to do a call for projects and then you have to submit to compete those have to be reviewed and ultimately rewarded. And that's generally about a, from a call to re award is generally a six month process, six to eight month process. The other, the other interesting thing with, uh, of, of IJA, uh, which is sometimes called EJA, and sometimes currently being referred to uh, from the White House is the bid or the bipartisan infrastructure deal which is not to be confused with Build Back Better, which is separate and apart, and that's the, the president's initiative, more around human infrastructure is the term being used. So it, it's a lot of, it's almost when you, re, when you read and check on things, you gotta make sure which one are we talking about here. Uh, but what I was gonna say is it's unprecedented in transportation reauthorization in modern times and I went back and I had an opportunity to talk to the secretary that was secretary of transportation under Bill Clinton and the secretary of transportation under both Bushes. And they have never seen a uh, reauthorization where the first year got all the increase. Usually the increase in funding was stepped over time and, and never quite this much either. So it is, it is 
historic in the level of funding at, at 21% over FAST Act levels generally at the base and then plus all this discretionary, which is, uh, you know, that's icing on the cake if you are to, if you win it. So uh, it's sort of interesting and uh, of how this is really playing out. What I tell you is, and everybody's asked, well, where's the list of projects? What are you going to do? Well, obviously we're working on that. And people, I, I had the opportunity to present yesterday at the, the Transportation Summit in Athens and, you know, everybody wants to know, well, what do you think about IJA? And I, I put up the quote from John F. Kennedy that many people know, a rising tide lifts all boats, which it does. And my message was, we're trying to align our boats in the harbor so that we can take full advantage of the IJA as we get the information, as we understand what the rules of the programs are so that we're ready. And that's going to take a little bit of time. It's not, uh, regrettably, it's not, you know, tomorrow or December 3rd or 10th or whatever the day may be that you're 100% ready to implement. It's going to take a little bit of time and we'll be strategic and uh, we'll have many presentations coming forward to talk about these new programs and opportunities that IIJ uh, present to, to us in Georgia and the nation as a whole. So a uh, whole, whole lot more to talk about. And uh, like I say, uh, it's, it's hard to boil it. I had to try to boil it down yesterday. Josh did a good job of boiling it down. These are the main components, but there is so much more in there, especially in uh, policy and especially in other programs and things such as Buy America, Buy American, uh, there's there's a lot of other there's a lot of other programs and things in there that may not be a, a funding program that have to be unpacked. So uh, we're we're working through that. So give us a little bit of time and a little bit of patience, and we'll we'll pledge to keep you informed as more information comes out, the details of this, and then ultimately what projects move forward. And uh, a lot of them, sort of, uh, Mr. Brown, to your point, like resiliency. You ask about resiliency. Well, there's a lot of coastal projects in Ann's district that qualify for that, that we're funding up some other fund source that now become eligible in this program. So there's going to be some chess pieces we move around strategically. Uh, and again, as Josh underscored in, in part of my orienting the ships in the harbor, there is an impact. More federal money means you need more state match. So we'll have to, we have to figure out how we get the more state match from our state funded projects and programs. So We'll have to figure out how we implement those in a, in a procedure that uh, keeps trying to keep everything, all the good things we have going, keep them, keep everything moving as best we can. But a rising tide does lift all boats. So that's a, that's a good, good message, I think. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Um, going now, we're moving from transition from federal to state and general assembly. <clears throat> so first off, before I, um, I think you know the general, there's a special session going on right now. The House and Senate have adopted for, for purposes of re redistricting. The House and Senate have sent to the governor both the state new state house map and the new state senate map. There was a joint a release today of a joint congressional map between House and Senate. You all should have, if you haven't already received it, there's, there's packets of those in the board suite. Uh, but the congressional map still has to go through the um, legislative process and be sent to the governor. You know, originally we were under the impression they were going to, to adjourn Friday. This may, because of the requisite time needed, may, may creep into Monday or over the weekend, <clears throat> but certainly we'll keep you updated on that. So just the updates so of the, the maps, the House and Senate ones are pending governor's signature and the con congressional is still working through the process. So next, uh, I want to highlight something at state level in the recent elections. There was a lot of focus on these uh, city county races, mayor races, mayor runoffs. But we had some exciting news that in seven of seven uh, counties have adopted their TIA county SPLOS. So you can see here, courtesy of ACCG, they always produce a, such a great map. You can see the four TIA regions um, that, have, that have adopted. And as, as a reminder, when House Bill 170 passed in 2015, the TIA law was updated to allow for counties rather than the regions uh, to, to, to be able to go on a county they, to pursue as a county t -spot. So now you can see if you, if, you, if you can do a quick count and then divide, it's almost two thirds, actually a little over two thirds, I believe, of the state is either in a county t -spot or a regional t -spot. So certainly this program is, is um, instrumental for a lot of local projects and even some projects on state routes where they partner with the department, you know, where a state route improvement is, is critical to them. So um, again, to see those 
uh, new counties and then two renewals on that list. And then there were two Oconee and Union where they were not able to, uh, the, the voters did not adopt those um, spots. So just wanted to highlight that uh, as a result of the recent election. And then next is the legislative agenda. So this is, we'll, I'll go through these items and then at the end uh, seek a, um, approval of the broad agenda to the committee that would then go to the board tomorrow. So first item is something we've talked about before with the board, but the last session we, we ultimately didn't get it incorporated into legislation, which is routine maintenance services, best value procurements. And so today, those routine maintenance activities that we do in the district, we're not talking about those ITB activities the, as a one-off, but looking at more of a complete service package to help sup, supplement the district forces where needed in some of the counties and some of the locations where we have um, where we may maybe have a challenge finding district forces to allow not just for price, but also a technical or quality component. Certainly price would be a predominant, predominating component, but also allow for technical. So again, this has been brought to the board before and the board has supported. Then this last session we had um, working as a result of the recommendations of the, the previous freight commission, they adopted some update to the state P3 laws, as well as in introduced three new alternative contracting methods. So like anything, no legislation is perfect. There's always room for perfecting. And so we've got some cleanups to that language dealing with um, ensuring that places like, or as otherwise, like cleanups like as otherwise um, allowed under law. And then also some provisions dealing with some of the negotiations that makes clear that as we're, as we're in negotiations that alternate proposals can be brought up and those type things just clean up to make sure it's clear. Um, and again, just as a reminder, so this step in the process, we, sort of the board, looks at endorsing sort of the, the categories that we're gonna tackle. And then as, as we get the legislation drafted, you know, this committee reconvenes every month during the session and we'll keep the board updated if there are any changes or if we have any amendments that come from outside, you know, the department and others, we'll, we'll bring that information back to the board, just as a reminder. The next item is uh, dealing with outdoor advertising and basically just making a tweak to the, the process where if someone's a sitting permit holder and they need to make an adjustment to the location. We're not talking about a, a major distance, but to adjust an angle or move it over, that they could do so under their existing permit as opposed to having to secure a second permit. So this would just allow for um, just a, a, a technical cleanup and, and to allow them, in some cases where you, you just got, there's been something that's blocking the sign or, or vegetation growth or something, um, a building's gone up, this would allow the relocation without having to seek a new permit a short distance. Then the update to the airport statute, and this is more one of those updates that looks towards the future by just adding the term um, heliport and vertiport. And this is public heliport and public vertiport. So if you've got a heliport for a helicopter today and it's private use, you're a hospital, this is, we're not talking about pulling that in, but this would include, as we look to the future of, of mobility and air mobility, where you might have a public heliport where people just show up to catch a ride, that they would be under the auspices of the licensing for the state because we have an obligation to ensure that when, when one of those is open to the public, that it's, that it's fully safe and, con and conforms with federal guidelines. So this is really just adding that term heliport and vertiport to the airport statute. Then the last item is something we've also brought back to the board, but anytime you're dealing with open records, uh, we, we continue to try and uh, perfect the language so we didn't ultimately pursue it last session. And this is, again, this is another one that's looking to the future as we continue to bring and have access to more and more transportation data, looking at, at how people are moving, going. We wanna make sure that there is no backdoor way that anyone could ever, through us and open records, get any personal information about someone in the public traveling. So this is a little bit of a proposal for belt and suspenders to ensure that no one could even go through us or through a vendor that we might have, try to use the Open Records Act to, to track an individual. We just wanna make sure that's clear because it's important to reassure the public that the data that we're using is completely anonymized and no one through us uh, could, could get that information. So with that, those are the five items. And again, as I said, is we have specific uh, language and if there are any changes, we will come back to the board as, as we do every session and, and provide an update each month. So with that, if there are any questions, any questions for many of our board members? Seeing none, Josh, thank you. And I'm glad our board members have been so active today in the discussion as we were on each slide of concern. And thanks for those answers, Commissioner, likewise to you. 
Um, and this is very valuable information and something that each and every one of us are interested. And I think that it has helped us to have some answers to give to questions that are addressed to us. So thank you very much. And and you a motion a, a, if from a committee member, a motion and a second to approve. Okay, do I have a motion? A second. I have motion and a second. Do we have any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any yeah. opposed? Any opposed? Hearing none, it has passed and we'll move forward with that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, because of the time, uh, our next meeting should be starting at 1.30 and we will start at 1.42. And now I call the Intermodal Committee uh, together in regards to uh, the issues that are before us. And I invite the Savannah Harbor Expansion Project information to be given to us by our Waterways Project Manager Division of Intermodal, and that is Raph Daniel. Uh, before Raph comes over, uh, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, um, and Commissioner, I just wanted to introduce to you uh, Trey Daniels, who is our Waterways Program Manager. We did an update in uh, September 2019, uh, 2019 and would like to give you another update on the Savannah Harbor Project. And Trey uh, will give you a, a detailed presentation on what that project is. Thank you so much and welcome to you. Good afternoon. Um, I do have some handouts to go along with my presentation. Um, just to start, oh, I'll wait till I um, just to start out a few uh facts about the Port of Savannah. We are the third busiest harbor in the United States. Right now they're the single largest terminal in operation at over 1,300 acres and they are the have been the fastest growing port in the last 15 years. The port does face a couple of challenges. Um, the ships are getting larger and before the ship project started they had the shallowest channel at port 42 feet of any container port in the United States. Which brings us to the Savannah Harbor Expansion Project. Um, this will deepen the harbor from 42 to 47 feet. Um, it has a benefit to cost ratio of 7.3 to 1. And um, we stand to have 2 million, 282 million in annual net benefits gained from transportation efficiencies. Um, we started, construction officially began in January of 2015. and. The dredging is scheduled to be completed next year. Um, as you see in front of you there, that's the ship placemat. Uh, the ship project isn't one standalone project. It's a combination of many features, which the mitigation features are the boxes in green and the navigational features are the boxes in blue. Uh, the ship partners, we partner with US Army Corps engineers. They are the lead federal agency for this project. And all the um, feature or the project constructions are designed, let, and administered by the Corps engineers. We also partner with the Georgia Ports Authority and GDOT as non-federal co-sponsors. GDOT's role in the SHIP project is primarily we are responsible for providing land, easements, and right-of-ways to the Corps engineers so they can construct their mitigation project. Um, we also provide technical assistance uh, during plan reviews for the core while they are uh, con for their construction projects. Um, just uh, as Clement mentioned, our last update was in 2019. These are some of the features that have been completed up until that time. The striped bass stocking, the freshwater wetland preservation, CSS Georgia recovery, 14A dike raising, uh, the tide gate removal, entrance channel dredging, raw water storage impoundment construction, and the dissolved oxygen systems. They are all completed now. And since our last meeting, a couple of projects have been uh, completed. Uh, one of them is the McCoy and Rifle Cut. Um, this is a flow rerouting 
because back in the 70s, the Corps engineers did these cuts to provide boaters easier access to the back and middle rivers. Um, during this process, it did allow for salt water to be pushed up towards the Savannah National Wildlife Refuge, which negatively impacted the salt of the freshwater marsh up there. So in order to cut down on the salt water, they decided to uh, plug these cuts back up. What you see there is actually dredged material that they put in there to, um, to, to fill in that area. Another item that they installed for the McCoy's Cut project was a submerged diversion structure. This is basically a sheet pile that is driven in the river that uh, provides more fresh water coming from upstream into the middle and back rivers. Now for some exciting news. Uh, another completed project is the Inner Harbor dredging. We, um, the, the shipping channel is approximately 20 miles, so the Corps broke up the contracts into two separate contracts. Um, Reach AB contract is basically from the Weston Hotel on up to the port and including the turning basin, the, the actual area where they turn the ships around. Um, this contract was awarded to Norfolk Dredging. Um, construction began in 20, October of 2019 and was completed of August of this year. So we are down to the 47 feet in that reach of the river. This was the um, Norfolk uh, used the dredge Charleston to do this work. This is actually a cutter head dredge. You can't see the mechanism now, it's in the water, but it has a long arm that rotates and actually dislodges the material at the bottom of the river, which is then pumped and transported to our DMCAs over in Jasper County. Um, a project that is currently underway is the second contract in the dredging of the Inner Harbor, Reach CD&E. This basically picks up at the Weston and goes down to the mouth of the Savannah River at the ocean. Um, Weeks Marine was awarded this contract. Uh, construction began in May of 2020 and is scheduled to be complete next year. This is the dredge they're using, the JS Chattery. It is also a cutter head dredge. Another ongoing ship project is currently the marsh restoration at Area 1S. This will restore this area back down to marsh elevation to provide additional brackish marsh habitat for wildlife. It was awarded to Michaels Corporation in July of this year, and they are currently installing silt fence and will begin the clearing and grubbing within the next few weeks. Um, the upcoming projects we have is a sediment basin package two, where it is the installation of a rock weir to fill in a deep, a naturally deep hole to lessen the uh, salt water column that travels through the back river. Also, there will be a construction of a public boat ramp on Hutchison Island. This will mitigate for the closures of Rifle and McCoy's Cut to provide boaters easier access to the back river. And also the construction of a fish passage up at New Savannah Bluff Lock and Dam in Augusta. So as you can see overall, we are at 94% complete with the whole SHEP project. Um, it's uh, getting very close now, and uh, for a project that's been 20 plus years in the making, it's, it's really exciting to see the, the end of the light at the end of the tunnel and have a deepened channel to provide for Savannah and the state as well as the nation. Any questions? Any questions? Yes, sir. Any additional comments or a question? Just a comment, Madam Chair. Yes. Just want to commend Trey for his work with the Corps and, and so many on this project. It has been it has been a long time, and he's he's been a steady steady source there. But also, I just want to commend Trey as as he mentioned these areas that they de water in. Most of this property we own is in South Carolina. Trey worked over, I guess, this last year, maybe the year before, over with uh, the folks in South Carolina to lessen our tax liability for the property we own. And so uh, that's a real return on investment as well, Mr. Boswell, is lessening our tax liability. So I just want to commend Trey for getting it done. And it wasn't easy, and he worked with the, he worked with the folks in South Carolina to make that happen, which obviously uh, saves taxpayer dollars. So congratulations, Trey. Thanks for all you do. Thank you, sir.
And also from, from me, I thank you because the port's located in the 1st Congressional District and I'm able to see this come to fruition as we work together. But I thank you for all that you have done to get it to this point and certainly appreciate this for our committee members. That's always valuable. So with that, any other remarks? Then this committee is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. We have eight minutes before the next committee meeting will be called. If we could have your attention, please. The statewide transportation planning strategic planning committee will now come to order. Uh, at this time, I'm going to ask our director, Janine Miller, if she will step forward and we will look at what we're going to be hearing about today and as an introduction from her. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, board members, great to be here and good to see you all in person and virtually as well, I imagine. Um, I'm here to, to introduce our two uh, presenters today, both from the Office of Planning. Uh, and uh, the first topic is going to be related to grad sites. Uh, stands for Georgia Ready for Accelerated Development. These are economic development sites, and uh, Tom Kaiafa, our branch chief for Metro Planning, is going to uh, talk more about what the grad sites are. Um, but I will, I will tell you, this is one of the keys to success, Georgia's success over the past uh, several several years, um, and in fact, a big contributor to why Georgia is once again number one state for business, uh, eighth year in a row, is at least due in part to the grad sites. And this, you'll hear today about how the work we do at GDOT helps support those grad sites getting ready for that development from a transportation connectivity and accessibility standpoint. Um, in particular, over the past uh, several years, um, grad sites have been um, occupied by a company called Renai and Griffin, um, Five Below in Monroe County, uh, Kubota in Gainesville, and even Amazon has uh, sited on one of these grad sites in, in Columbia County. Um, so we're, we're very excited to continue to support this build out. In fact, we have more than five dozen grad sites throughout the state. And this is this is nearly doubled uh, since Governor Kemp took office. He's taken this on as a as a primary uh, component of of the work that that his administration is doing. So excited about that. So that'll be Tom Kaiafa, our branch chief uh, for Metro Atlanta planning, no, Met Metro planning, non non Atlanta. But we're doing also a capital planning update, and what you'll hear about today uh, from Daniel Dolder, one of our uh, planners in the Atlanta branch, is. Uh, related to the Georgia commute options. Some of you might have previously known it as the Clean Air Campaign. It started in the mid-90s and it's it's really taken on a very important uh, life and, and activity set in Metro Atlanta even before COVID. Uh, so we were ahead of the game and I'm very excited that Daniel's going to present about that. Uh, Roz Tucker, who's our lead partner at the Atlanta Regional Commission, is here as well. Um, they're, the work that they ha had laid the groundwork with, um, engaging mostly with uh, private companies and, and even, even governments to assist in how to, how to demystify teleworking, how to help folks get onto transit and do alternate commutes uh, in a way that, that has tremendous public benefits, but also makes those um, employers of choice, which nowadays, if you can be an employer of choice, you have a better chance of getting that limited workforce. So great work that uh, once again has been occurring here at GDOT for for a couple decades now, and you'll get to hear from that, hear from Daniel for that. So I'll go ahead and bring up Tom, 
and he can take it from here. Welcome. Thank you, Janine. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner, members of the board. I'll just go ahead and uh, dive right in. Uh, so today we're going to discuss uh, what the Office of Planning has been doing regarding the uh, grad site assessment uh, throughout the state of Georgia. So a little bit of back, uh, can anyone hear me by the way on the mic? All right, thank you. Uh, a little bit of background on grad sites. Uh, grad stands for Georgia Ready Accelerated Development and uh, what the program does is uh, the Georgia Department of Economic Development uh, promotes these sites for uh, kind of industrial development and also ready for any sort of fast track construction and generally uh, the criteria for some that involves uh, environmental assessment, uh, geotechnical investigation and uh, zoning and utility review. Uh, as part of this, uh, grad sites make up a kind of a small portion of about 900 or so development sites uh, throughout the state of Georgia and only a small portion as noted are grad certified. And uh, this, this site selector here is uh, on the uh, Georgia Department of Economic Development's website. Uh, some background on that, there are currently 67 current grad sites in the state of Georgia, 61 of them are certified and six are what they call certified select, which involves an additional amount of review or so. Uh, to qualify for that grad status, uh, the available sites have to meet programs due diligence standards, be reviewed by a third party, and also earn the final approval of a board of advisors comprised of public and private sector economic development professionals. Uh, the certification is valid, valid for about three years or 36 months, uh, but can re be renewed through an application process. Uh, certified select sites, as mentioned, go through additional documentation and vigor. Uh, and also, in addition to the 67 sites, there are also three mega sites, which are legacy locations for basically prime large developments such as automakers or uh, any sort of uh, manufacturing facility. Um, many of our certified select and mega sites are in or in close proximity to, proximity to our MPO areas, and the map kind of gives a little bit of breakdown on, on these areas. Uh, some of the minor statistics, some of the statistics on the sites, uh, 14 counties have multiple grad sites, with 11 of them being We'll have two sites and three counties, Barrow, Bryan, and Louds have three sites apiece. And over 40% of these grad sites are located in Southern Georgia in districts four and five. Uh, our purpose of our study was to develop a sort of methodology to assess these grad sites based on uh, the transportation infrastructure characteristics surrounding them. Uh, our goal is to provide that Department of Economic Development with transportation data that could be included with this grad site info. Uh, to identify investment opportunities to improve the infrastructure access as well as connectivity and also inc basically increasing attractiveness of the sites to potential customers. And all the current sites as of March of this, this year were assessed as part of the study. And the whole point, one, basically the whole point was to kind of highlight any assets that we could brag about to prospective customers and businesses looking to relocate to the state. Uh, as part of the assessment, we'd, we, along with our consultant, developed this, a transportation screening tool that was designed to weight and score the, 60, uh, the 70 sites that were uh, analyzed as part of this process. And uh, in general, uh, our point was to provide user-specific weightings and evaluate them based on that transportation infrastructure using those weightings. And uh, this, this particular screen is the front page of it. Um, if we, we also have uh, the tool for if you guys would like to take a look at the tool, that would uh, that would be available for your uh, review as well. Uh, as part of the tool, uh, we broke down uh, the criteria into, uh, which was originally 25 different type criteria into five different themes, geography, existing transportation infrastructure, proximity, condition, and projects, and some of the relevant criteria is noted in the uh, box in the center. And uh, geography was defining the areas where the site was located, uh, the adjacent facility was basically uh, criteria providing any characteristics of the roadway that the site would likely connect to. Proximity was the distance from the grad site to any sort of major transportation infrastructure, such as an interstate highway, uh, grip corridor, uh, rail line, uh, uh, Hartsfield Airport, or uh, the port of Savannah's, ports of Savannah and Brunswick, for, for example. Uh, the condition, uh, pretty self-explanatory, the condition of the transportation infrastructure in the vicinity of the site and projects were previously per identified in program GDOT projects in the vicinity of the site through either the STIP or an MPO's TIP. Uh, and uh, some of the existing attributes for grad sites, and these, these particular sites had uh, infrastructure that was considered pretty well and ready to go to have around the site. Uh, two of them are one is the Interstate Center in Bryan County. Uh, some of the 
positive attributes of that included its adjacency to Interstate 16 and also access to the Port of Savannah, the Landport facility, and Savannah Hilton Head Airport. And the other we highlight is one university parkway off in Barrow County between Lawrenceville and Athens. It's located adjacent to State Route 316, which is part of the state freight network, and it also has access to CS CSX's rail line between Atlanta and Athens. And they are no those are noted on the map as well. And uh, on the other side of the coin, uh, we looked at different possible projects for uh, grad sites that could benefit from additional transportation infrastructure. Uh, these three projects in particular are different parts of uh, wide variety, part, different parts of the state, including the Highland 75 in Bartow County, which is also located within the Cartersville MPO, uh, the Berrien Business Park in Berrien County, which is located in South Georgia, just north of Augusta, and the Kings Mill Commerce Park in Jefferson County, just southwest of Augusta. And some of the improvements we looked at uh, include uh, road widenings in the surrounding uh, corridors to the sites, uh, roundabouts, uh, bridge replacements, and also uh, resurfacing of, of these um, of the surrounding corridors. And the intended results range from improving capacity to addressing high uh, crash rates, uh, improving safety along the corridors as, as well, and then also uh, looking at upgrading rail crossings in the immediate area. So some of our next steps will be uh, continued coordination with the Department of Economic Development to include their transportation attributes into its promotional messaging, uh, continue coordinate, be in coordination with the individual GDOT districts as well as the MPOs, especially given that 30, about a little less than a third of the sites are located within the MPO areas in the state, and a continue to review projects for possible funding and programming, either through the Freight and Rural Lump Sum Program, uh, incorporation to the state freight and logistics plan update that's ongoing and most recently the IIJA funding that was uh, has been a hot topic in Congress as of late. And uh, does anyone have any questions? Any questions? Any comments? Seeing none, thank you so much Tom. Thank you Madam Chair. And I believe Daniel Hello, good afternoon. My name is Daniel Dolder, and I am the Air Quality CMAC Planner in the Office of Planning, and I'm here to give a brief overview of the Georgia Commute Options Program and transportation demand management in general, and particularly the work that the GCO team has done throughout the pandemic. Um, the program is sponsored by CMAC funds. They're provided to us to improve the air quality within the region, and transportation demand management is one of the most cost beneficial ways for us to achieve that. Um, what I mean by transportation demand management is just us getting people to not drive alone to and from work, taking alternative commutes, clean commutes as we like to call them, such as carpool van pool, bicycle trips, walk trips, transit, telework, flex work. Um, as Janine mentioned, we've administered the program since 1994 when it was originally the Clean Air Campaign. <clears throat> And we rebranded, re, uh, we rebranded the program to Georgia Commute Options in 2013, and in 2017, partnered with ARC for them to take over the day-to-day -day operations. So, uh, throughout the pandemic, we've been instrumental in setting up telework programs with our employers, schools, local governments, and property managers throughout the region. We wouldn't have been able to do that if we weren't already setting up these telework uh, programs in the past. Us having the history to be able to do this allowed us to seamlessly transition a lot of businesses in the pandemic. Um, and as you can see, we uh, made a commute impact report where uh, we continually surveyed all our partners throughout the program to see how effective the telework policies that they were putting in place were, how their employers were or commuters were reacting to them. And um, yeah, uh, typically we found that employers, commuters throughout the region were working four days or teleworking four days a week during the height of the pandemic, currently three days a week. And they're expected or, or commuters would like to in the future still telework two and a half days approximately throughout the week. 
Uh, currently, this is a snapshot of the program of all our property managers, all our employer partners, the total commuters, uh, the number of trips that are alternate or clean commutes, and not surprisingly, you can see a large majority of those are telework trips now. Uh, we continually monitor the program to make sure that we're achieving the objectives that we want to achieve, which you can see on the screen here. Primarily, we do that through extensive survey work. Um, we also produce an annual report that really dives deep into all the details. Um, some of the major benefits of transportation demand management are less congestion, better health, better air quality, better quality of life, and less stress on our existing transportation infrastructure. Uh, this slide shows the entire region that the program covers. We're also in partnership with seven of our local TMAs that um, help us focus really specifically in their areas, which are the major job markets within the area. We also partner with multiple local governments. We like to call them the four C's, the cities, counties, chambers, and CIDs. We received a number of requests from them immediately once the pandemic started, 75% more than we typically do. Currently, we're partnered with 39 cities, 19 counties, 12 CIDs, and 21 chambers. These are all of the services that are included in transportation demand management. And what we do is we approach a potential partner or business and say, here's all the things we can do for y'all. Pick and choose which ones you want, customize it to your needs, and we'll try to help you out. The most popular ones being transit passes, uh, trip planning, ride sharing, and uh, any number of parking issues that a particular business might might have. Uh, we track all our data through our app, which you can download on the App Store. Uh, you can log in, check your incentives, log your clean commutes. Um, you have five dollars a day if you're switching from a clean, from an SOV trip to a clean commute. Monthly gas cards, monthly drawings. Also housed within the app, um, <clears throat> you earn points for every trip that you log, and you can redeem those points for coupons at any of the local businesses. And as we return to the normal, return to the office, hopefully, um, our team is ready to help out any businesses that need help transitioning that, altering their formal telework policies, anything involved with that. And um, to further brag on the program, we are nationally recognized for both our marketing, social media campaigns, and the research that was done throughout the pandemic. And um, we've also helped other local states set up their TDM programs as well, giving them our, our advice, what we've learned works, doesn't work. And that's all I've got. Any questions? Any questions or comments for Daniel? Yes. I got a ton of questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I've, I've heard Georgia commute options on the radio, you know, advertised. I had no clue it was associated with GDOT. And now I'm looking at the website that says ARC, and you mentioned ARC. I'm just confused. Is it a GDOT organization or an ARC organization? We provide the funding to ARC, and then we work in partnership with them and just provide oversight. That transition happened back in 2017. Okay, and, and, and why is it the Office of Planning, just as a matter of interest, how does it fall under the planning department? That's a good question that I don't really have an answer for because that happened before I was here. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Does Russell, well, I'm trying to find out for you. <laughs> yeah, no, so it's, 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 through the, it's through the funding process and, and back in uh, 2018, uh, we, we previously delivered this program ourselves uh, ARC was doing very similar work as well and have a lot of great resources, especially the reach they have here locally in the metropolitan Atlanta area. So that's when uh, we came together and thought it would be best to harness all the efforts collectively and then have ARC basically deliver the program 
with their other resources they have. And it's been a really good success. With, and ARC has done a fantastic job delivering the program. Daniel and the team in planning do have a responsibility, a fiduciary responsibility, to ensure that the metrics are met and, and the project achieves the goal in a close working relationship as well. Uh, for that and how it got the planning, I think was when it was stood up in the 90 in the nineties due to air quality non-attainment uh, at DOT. That's it's been it's been housed there ever since. Uh, and again, planning does the allocation of the funding and all of that, which is very nuanced for this program. Uh, so, uh, so that's that's sort of the history of, of flights there. And and, and it's true, truly a, a great partnership uh, that. Really, again, you know, you sort of want that, what you've heard, that brand identity of Georgia commute options, you know, nobody's going to think too much about DOT or whatever. You really want to target it there, and ARC has done a fantastic job. Another question? Are you okay, Kevin? <laughs> you said a lot, so I was expecting <laughs> number three and number four. <laughs> thank you. Um, any other questions or statements? Well, thank you, Daniel, so much. Very informative. Appreciate it. With that, this committee stands adjourned. The next committee will be the Committee of the Whole at 3 p.m. Okay, at this time, let's go ahead and bring our committee of the whole. Uh, Jamie, if you don't mind to please uh, come to attention. Sorry, Mr. Boswell. Um, anyway, today we've got a couple of items on our agenda. The first one is our winter weather planning update. Uh, Ms. Emily Fish, our Assistant State Maintenance Engineer from Emergency Operations, is here today to present. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Commissioner, members of the board. Uh, I'm Emily Fish, Assistant State Maintenance Engineer. I just want to give you a brief overview of emergency operations as a whole. Our team consists of four employees that assist the department in preparing for, responding to, recovering from, and mitigating incidents and disasters for the agency. We do this in a variety of ways, including updating and standardizing our emergency response plans annually, coordinating and maintaining um, relationships with our external partners, such as GEMA and jurisdictions, and we work with our federal partners, such as Federal Highways and FEMA, to apply for reimbursements on declared disasters. Just a brief overview of what I will discuss today, our winter weather outlook for this year, seasonal preparations, program updates, and some statewide statistics. This year's winter weather outlook was released by NOAA. It is released at the beginning of the season. I want to note that this is an indicator of the season, not a prediction or a forecast. This year, for the second winter in a row, La Nina will have an impact on our season. Above average temperatures and warmer, drier conditions are favored across the southern U.S. However, we cannot rely on this and we are always preparing for the statewide winter weather event. For seasonal preparations, we conduct two types of dry runs. The first type of dry run is completed in each district in coordination with the Office of Equipment Management to ensure that equipment is maintained and functioning cor correctly. Quick repairs are made on site and secondary inspections occur to put the equipment in service for, season, for the season. Um, it just ensures the safety of all of our employees utilizing that equipment. The second type of dry run occurs when our southern districts visit the metro area and our other northern districts to ride their assigned brine and plow route. During dry runs, newer employees are trained on equipment, routes, and they are updated on winter weather plans for their districts. Each October, a, an agency-wide winter weather coordination meeting occurs and this verifies that all departments are prepared to assist the citizens of Georgia during a winter weather, winter weather event. 
We also conduct one-on-one -on -one meetings with each district um, and the division director of field districts to ensure that district plans, staffing, and equipment and opportunities are discussed. So on the state response plan that is coordinated out of Forest Park, um, we have added routes to our state response. These routes were already being brined and plowed by districts, but we have alleviated districts one and six of some of those routes so that they can focus on other priority routes within their own districts. So we have added I-75 from the Emerson Alatuna exit to the Tennessee state line. We've added 575 north to the Pickens County line. And we've added um, extended Georgia 400 to Buford Highway and added this to our response plan as well. This is an overview of what we are now coordinating out of our facilities in Forest Park. Um, and all of these are part of the state response plan. Some new updates and new technology for this year. We have uh, currently we estimate our stockpiles of salt by hand. So we are pilot project we are piloting a project called Stockpile Reports. It will we are installing five cameras into salt barns across the state in districts one, two, six, and seven. The cameras utilize LIDAR technology to measure the piles of salt. By automating this, we will increase our efficiency and accuracy of our on-hand uh, stockpiles. We plan to um, incorporate more of this around the state next year. And we, uh, this was a, a uh, project that was brought to the state maintenance office through the management development program that you'll hear about next year or in the next board meeting. We have also started upgrading our WebEOC program. WebEOC is utilized daily in the traffic management center and we utilize it during large scale emergencies. WebEOC will be more efficient and easier to use. Incident dashboards, like the one on your screen, will give a broad overview of how an incident is unfolding across the state in real time. The upgrade was also designed to support long-term initiatives in the emergency operations program as it grows. The Road Weather Information System, or RWIS as we call it in-house, um, is also being upgraded. This year, we currently have 60 sensors across the state, and we are consistently adding more. The sensors have the ability to display current and forecasted air and ground temperatures, precip precipitation types, rates, and accumulations, pavement grip, and alerts us of weather warnings across the state. The system allows us to monitor incoming winter weather, tailor our responses, and proactively identify potential areas with issues. It is also publicly accessible via the National Weather Service. This is an example of what one of the sensors will show you if you were to look it up. We are also engaging publicly consistently this year. So we have published our 2021 winter weather guide. It is available on the GDOT homepage. And we are coordinating with our external partners such as Georgia State Patrol and Atlanta DOT to refresh on our response plans, discuss changes, routes, and share our contact information. This week, we will also be filming a video blog about winter weather preparedness. This will give viewers an inside look of our brine farms, equipment, and an overview of our operations. Lastly, statistics. Um, we have 2,100 on-call employees throughout the state. We will be working on 49,000 plus lane miles. We have 50,000 tons of salt on hand. We have 1.25 million gallons of brine on hand and we can produce another 50,000 gallons of brine per hour statewide. We have 407 snow removal dump truck units currently ready to go for this season. Are there any questions? <laughs> any questions, comments? Comment, Madam Chair. I just, just want to come in. You just want to commend Emily and for her work and, and transition as, as Larry Barnes was retired. It's, she's been busy not only in, in winter weather preparedness, but dealing with floods and, and the lock that we've seen through the fall and, and doing a great job. I just, I just again, again, the technology and the professionalism here is, is just impressive to see how far we've come in a fairly short period of time as we're prepared. And, and it's nice that Emily's presenting and it's 72 degrees outside and on November 17th so uh, but that too will change so always prepare for the you know 
plan for the worst and hope for the best is is where where she and her team is and Matt Needham's here as well provides great support to all our districts and in, in implementation but that web EOC she showed you that dashboard is uh, fantastic and it was developed years ago after Snowmageddon to basically that between us and all the resource agencies at the Emergency Operations Center use that and it's the one data platform that everybody's working out of. So when you have emergency, uh, your emergency EMA directors uh, from the counties call in the GEMA, it all gets into one data source. So we all can keep up in real time about what's going on around the state. And it's a, it's a great tool and the, the update of it's uh, certainly enhanced and will make us be even more efficient in uh, coordination and communication around the state with all the needs that get in there and during a during a storm event it gets pretty busy in that thing it'll 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 have every location of what you know if it's a tree down if that's ice on the road whatever the situation is and also geolocate it so that we we know real time what's going on so it's uh, quite a quite a professional operation and any any winter weather event if it's safe to get out we'd welcome you over to EOC and see what's going on real time. That just may be at 2 or 3 a.m. in the morning, though, if you, you're welcome, 24-7. Uh, so I tell everybody, when you get over there with Emily and our team on Emergency Operations Center, it's a little bit like Vegas. You lose time, track of day and night, because you can't see outside, and this all blurs together. So, But thank you, and thank you, Madam Chair, for letting me have those comments. Of course, and I'll say thank you for upgrading more uh, the road sensors. I know many school systems and news people use those quite a bit to to predict their things. But I wouldn't be surprised with all this flooding if next year or next spring you come with a summer weather advisory plan. So because anymore it's been kind of hectic. But any other comments or questions? Okay, thank you. Okay, next we have uh, Andrew Honig, our P3 Project Manager for Alternative Contracting Method Rules. That's very good. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you. Is this high enough? I'll have to sink down a little bit. <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and members of the board and commissioner. And as uh, she mentioned, I'm here to present the Alternative Contracting Methods Rules and Regulations and hopefully to seek favorable approval uh, for their advertisement at tomorrow's uh, official board meeting. So this applies to chapter 672-22, and you can see I'll give you a recap there of uh, what's included in sections one through nine. <clears throat> so uh, HB 577 was passed earlier this year. It became officially uh, uh, implemented in July of this year, and it uh, added to section 672-22, and it added uh, the section called Governing Alternative Contracting Methods, and we included some of the other sections there, uh, 672.17 governing P3 projects, and then 672-18 governing uh, DB procedures as well. There's a little bit of a crosswalk between those two, or those three procedures that I'll, uh, that I'll get to in a minute here. <clears throat> and again, uh, hopefully tomorrow I'll, we'll, we'll uh, have approval to notice of an, or for the notice of intended action to advertise them publicly uh, for comment. So how did we get here and what has happened? What have we done since July? Um, Again, 577 was passed, and then since that time, we've been reaching out and doing industry uh, outreach to Georgia Highway Contractors and to the Consultant Committee, ACEC. Um, you may remember I did present uh, construction management general contracting uh, method back in September. That's a, a piece of this that I'll get into, CMGC and how that works. So that was back in September. Since that time, we have talked to JISFIC. Uh, JISFIC has been doing CMGC for, for a while now, so it was really interesting to see how they have done things in Georgia. And then again, here we are for uh, tomorrow's board presentation, at least, uh, seek favorable approval for advertising for a 30-day period. Uh, so hopefully we'll get that comment period closes in December, and then early next year uh, we'll have approval of those rules. And then, of course, beginning of next year, we'll start uh, implementing the rules and working on the manual. Um, so, you know, this is kind of the 10,000-foot level with the, the rules and regulations, and then once we get that established, we're already starting to work on the, the ACM manual. Uh, but that'll be kind of the lower level guiding documents for implementation of those procedures. So, uh, so I've touched on what we've done. Uh, I didn't mention specifically with the state DOTs that we reached out to. Minnesota and Tennessee have a really robust CMGC program. So it was really interesting to talk to them with their, um, their procedures, their lessons learned about what projects they use CMGC for. 
And then Texas was really good on the CDA and PDA side of things um, uh, to talk to their program and what they've done with those strategies. Uh, and I talked about JISFIC and GHCA and ACEC have really been instrumental. We actually received uh, Georgia Highway contractors feedback already on the rules. And then the, the version that we published to you guys um, did have those comments addressed from GHCA. So laying this out here, this is uh, uh, where the, co the uh, code is <laughs> going to fit. Uh, 32.282 will be alternative contracting methods. And then 32.280 is P3, whereas 32.281 is design build contracting. I'll get into what is PDA, CDA, and CMGC, but those are the three alternative contracting methods. Uh, it's important to kind of differentiate between P3 and DB and ACM. They are three distinct delivery methods. And obviously, as you all know, P3 and DB have been established for a while in Georgia, uh, but now we're moving into a new uh, 32282, which will cover alternative contracting methods. So I've been throwing around this acronym a lot, PDA and CDA, so I wanted to discuss it for a minute what that means. Uh, PDA is a pre-development agreement. Um, all three of these delivery methods uh, are common in that you bring the contractor in earlier up front into the preliminary engineering side of things before you let the project. A PDA uh, is an opportunity to procure one or more contractors to collaborate with GDOT on one or more projects to perform uh, preliminary engineering services, concept document, uh, they can do cost estimating, alternative analysis is really key with a PDA. Um, one differentiation that I'll touch on though is that um, the department still does the NEPA document. Um, Federal Highway rules uh, are very stringent on that, that uh, the department still does the NEPA document. But you can still seek involvement from the contractor and, you know, questions, how are you going to stage this project? What will the impacts be? Uh, it's really good uh, to bring the contractor in early. Uh, so a PDA, you bring them into preliminary engineering, but you can also pursue uh, that project into construction with that same team if you so choose. Uh, but its main purpose is to kind of get them involved preliminarily. A comprehensive development agreement, which is CDA, is another delivery method where you bring in a contractor and a designer uh, to procure a single multi-phase contract that allows the contractor to perform, you know, development of the concept, uh, design and construct of a project, and then O&M as well uh, can factor in if we so choose again. But those ones, you have, again, a contractor and a designer, you bring them in up front to, to, to uh, uh, walk through and develop the project. So these are really good with kind of scope, scope finalization. If we're not exactly sure what the scope of the project is really going to be uh, finally, then you can bring them in and uh, help answer some of those questions. So I touched on CMGC real quick, though. That's where you bring in a designer and a contractor, two separate contracts, but you have that involvement, that collaboration up front. And typically, those are smaller projects, especially when we talk to other states. Uh, they're more in the design build range, like 20 million to 150 million. It's pretty good for CMGC, whereas typically a PDA and CDA is a little bit bigger project. So here's the, uh, the sections, uh, one through nine again, uh, just kind of the agenda from here is what uh, I'll talk about. So section 672.22-01, statement of policy and procedures of rules and regulations. <clears throat> this establishes policy for using ACM to deliver a project. Uh, and what sort of factors we're considering when making the recommendation to go this route. Again, um, you know, uh, uh, good candidates would be projects that require contractor involvement. How do they stage the project? Um, you know, what is their gonna approach gonna be? Uh, they lend themselves well to ACM delivery. So the other point on this section is that um, it does require board approval to use ACM. So whenever we recommend a project for ACM delivery, uh, we would come back to the board and, and, and get that approval before we do so. 677.22-02 is really just definitions uh, for use later in the, uh, the, the rules. So just defining terms like PDA and CDA that I already touched on. Uh, general rules for ACM agreements provides framework for procurement process regarding ACM. <clears throat> uh, for design build projects, we use the Georgia Procurement Registry and we advertise what's called a PNA, a Public Notice of Advertisement. So we put that out there to let the contracting industry know that it's coming. <clears throat> and then uh, p and will be uh, notification of an RFP to come. And the RFP can be uh, one phase or two phase, um, depending on the structure that we set up. Uh, 
one thing though also is that us will use db procurement statute for acm with private finance without private financing excuse me so a design build uh again that goes back to 32 281 we we'll use that procurement strategy for acm projects without private financing and then for projects with private financing we'll use 3280 3280 which is the p3 uh, recommendations uh, each ACM authorized an initial phase of work with subsequent phases only at GDOT discretion. So I touched on, you know, it's really key to bring that contractor in up front uh, and uh, bring them into preliminary engineering. You, you only go forward into construction if we so choose. So that's established in this section. Uh, and then it's important to note that each phase, again, preliminary construction and O&M if we choose, those are considered one project, one solicitation. And that's kind of the whole purpose of that is that you don't need to re-procure to find another contractor you already have that contractor on board. Uh, CMGC uh, procurement process is outlined in 04, uh, process for announcement of CMGC. Again, we'll probably use the Georgia Procurement Registry. Uh, <clears throat> and it'll be, uh, it'll also have the pre-qualification process. So it'll have the minimum compliance with GDOT pre-qualification rules. Typically that's, you must be pre-qualified in the state to do business as a contractor or to do business as a consultant. You must be pre-qualified. And then uh, also evidence of bonding capacity. You know, are you capable of delivering uh, this size of project? Procurements may be one phase or two phase. Uh, we've seen a lot of other uh, states use interviews when they're doing these uh, major projects. You know, you really want to know who you're working with uh, before you, you do business with them. And typically we've seen qualifications based selection for these uh, ACM projects. So uh, SOQs will be certainly considered from contracting industries. Uh, are they are they qualified to do the work? Do they have the expertise? Uh, who are they going to bring in? Um, and then there also there'll also be a pre-construction services fee as part of that evaluation factor evaluation factors. And then uh, the third thing, you qualifications based uh, pre-construction services fee, and then a technical approach. How are they going to differentiate themselves uh, to get this work? So chapter five uh, rules governing construction management agreements establishes requirements that may be performed by CMGC during pre-construction services, like what are they going to be doing? Typically, again, it's con uh, concept report, uh, constructability reviews, staging uh, questions, you know, environmental feedback, uh, certainly a circle between working with the designer and the contractor. So this section kind of stipulates what those, uh, what those works can be, what the contractor can do can to help with. Uh, we do also anticipate the contractor provide a price proposal uh, we anticipate the price proposal would be kind of a benchmark for what their bid is going to be. We also have an independent estimate done on our side to compare and contrast. Uh, it's actually a little bit of a negotiation there. You can see the fourth bullet um, to get that right price, you know, uh, <clears throat> to make sure that we're capable of uh, budgeting the project correctly. Uh, authorizes negotiations and performance of construction work packages. This is also one of the benefits of CMGC. A lot of times uh, they will uh, start the project in work packages where you may have phases of a project delivered over time. So that's one of the benefits as well. Yep. Excellent. Uh, uh, so chapter six and chapter seven are pretty similar. They uh, uh, lay out the rules for PDA in chapter six and CDA in chapter six, uh, establishes the use and the form agreements. It also gets into confidentiality. Confidentiality on these uh, procurements are, is very important. So it establishes when confidentiality, confidentiality extends from and goes to and who it applies to. So that's very important in these. <clears throat> and then the last two uh, sections, chapter eight covers the size and frequency limitations for eight uh, alternative contracting method projects. We're not gonna use these uh, methods for every project. It's gonna be pretty limited. This is covered in the legislation that was passed, but no more than two ACM projects awarded in a single fiscal year, and then no more than seven ACM projects awarded in a single 10-year period. And then also, uh, so that's in terms of like the number of projects we're gonna be doing, and then in terms of size, uh, no more than 5% of the GDOT annual capital budget from the previous fiscal year. <clears throat> so that's laid out in, uh, in this section. And then chapter nine covers uh, reporting on who we have to report to. Uh, this is very similar to design build. We actually send a report out every fiscal year on the number of design build projects. So we do a similar exercise for ACM contracts. Uh, we would send them, uh, it's laid out who we would send them to uh, every year, the total contracts awarded and the total construction value. And then every five years, we would provide a report on the benefits of ACM delivery versus other uh, GDOT delivery methods. 
So that was the chapters. Uh, so now the next steps and where we're going from here. Uh, again, tomorrow we, we would seek favorable uh, consideration of our notice of intended action and approval to move forward to open the rules uh, for public consumption. We do anticipate putting them on the alternative delivery webpage, uh, putting them up as soon as we get approval to do so, and then a 30-day comment period would end on December 20th. And then uh, hopefully we can address those uh, comments. I'm sure Russell would want us to address them over Christmas break so that we are very, very ready to have them at our January 20th uh, board meeting for approval. And with that, I'm uh, certainly free to open it, answer any questions. Any questions or comments? That was a very concise report for a lot of material. So, okay, at this time, do we have a motion to approve the alternative contracting method rule changes to be passed to the meeting tomorrow? Do you have a second? Any questions or comments? All in favor? Any opposed? The motion passes. And thank you, Mr. Holding, very much. And so this meeting is now adjourned.